even need the music for this one by this point. But you can use it if you want to. It's on... Uh, Page 14. Let's stand together. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the Be seated. All right, as everyone kind of comes up, get settled, grab your mic. Yep, go ahead and welcome them up. Go ahead and welcome them up. Jason, Jason, you're here, right here. You got the you got the pretty blue chair. Toby, you're in the middle. Megan, you're in the blue chair also. You get the nice cushy, cushy chairs. I see what they did here. Yep. So, so real quick, before we get started, we're going to enter into our live show. It's actually going to be streaming live right now on Twitter, YouTube, if they don't cancel us again, uh, <laughs> Facebook, and all that stuff. And here's how it works. Okay, when we start our show, we got our music, it comes on, and when the music comes out, I welcome everybody, and you guys give a loud, you know, studio cheer. Okay, because you, remember, you're the studio, so give a loud studio cheer and get into it. This is interactive. In other words, you can laugh at us, too, and it can, and it, you know. You, you can, can laugh at Gabe. Don't nobody be it's, laughing it's at okay. me. They, 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 they often do that because I got the most confidence on the crew, so I don't mind you guys laughing at me. It might hurt their feelings a little bit. So, um, so we're going to get the show started. We also got an amazing announcement coming at the front of the show about where the conference is going to be next year. Excited to be sharing that with you here in a minute. Cross Politic begins in three, two, one. that breaks for a dying city. Stop cursing your future. <laughs> is not true. For all intents and purposes, I am a woman. No government, no political system has ultimate supremacy. Jesus is king of kings, and it's about time our nation returned in humble submission to his lordship. You are not protecting women. You are authorizing the destruction of 500,000 little women every year. I didn't start it. Sir, sir, with all due respect, that's the argument of a five-year-old. I didn't start it. Right, when the spirit comes upon people, they go to war. They go to battle, and the enemies of God are driven back, and they're slaughtered. You are listening to Cross Politic with Gabe Wrench, the water boy, Pastor Toby Sumter, and the Chocolate Knox. Hey, y'all, welcome to Cross Politic Live in Knoxville! Yes! I'm gonna go sit with them. Yes. I'm going to go hang out with these folks over here. Yeah, you like that? That's the amen corner somewhere on this side. Did someone say Aslan? Yeah. <laughs> All right, welcome. We're, we're live in Knoxville, Tennessee at our Fight, Laugh, Feast conference. It's good to be with a great crowd. Good, good to be with you online also. Um, now, before we get started, you guys, I think you guys came to the conference just for this announcement alone. Yes. Next year's conference. Um, so... We originally started the conference in Nashville, and, and we wanted to pick a conservative state um, because of the whole COVID stuff, and so we wanted to kind of, kind of help conservative efforts be more conservative. Conservatives have a hard time being conservative and remaining conservative, so we, <laughs> we, we wanted to kind of be a help to Tennessee. Tennessee needed the help, and then we ended up in Knoxville this year, 
And, and now, you know, one of the things that I mentioned at the very beginning of all this, that Christians aren't thinking big enough. When we went to the Ark Encounter on Tuesday and walked through the Ark Encounter and Ken Ham, you know, built this Ark for you know, $100 million dollars. And they bring in 1.5 million Christians, or 1.5 million people every year, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. 1.5 million people, 30% of them, 300,000 of those people are not Christians. And so we said, man, we got to do our conference at the Ark Encounter next year. Yes. Yes. That's right. So we're going to be at the Ark Encounter next year, October 12th, 13th, and 14th. It is a fast, fantastic, family-friendly event. They got a, a, literally, they got a petting zoo for the kids and Knox. They have um, a we're virtual. Gonna, we're gonna get Knox to do ride a camel. <laughs> ride a camel. They do, yeah, ride a they camel. Do, they do camel rides and, and milk a camel. Um, <laughs> and they got a virtual reality uh, uh, show where you actually can participate in um, seeing the flood and kind of experiencing what it was virtually like to be a part of the flood as we think it is, um, kind of a, a venue. And then they got a great conference event center. It holds about 2,000 to 2,500 people. We're probably gonna cap tickets next year at 2,000. Um, and so bring your whole family, your whole family. I mean, there, there's hotels around. The whole park basically deserves probably about um, eight hours of your time alone. So we're gonna try to uh, structure the times where you can have plenty of time to go through the park, go through the Ark Encounter and all that. So that's kind of our, our big announcement. We're, we're super excited about it. And, and this is for, hopefully, part of what you come away and walk away from next year's conference is on the politics of six-day creation. Ken Ham will be speaking there. Dr. Gordon Wilson, if you guys know the good Dr. Wilson. Yes. Yep, right in the dance. He'll be speaking there. Um, it's, it's, we're just, I'm just, I hope you guys walk away thinking like, man, why didn't we build this? Why didn't, what are we building in my town? Amen. How are we? I asked Ken on this. I'm just going to keep going for a second. Tripology. Yeah. I asked Ken. We interviewed Ken, he, um, uh, and, and I pulled a Judas on him. I said, how come you didn't spend this $100 million on the poor? Why didn't you spend that $100 million on the poor? And Ken responded to me. He turned it back on me and said, well, how many people is your church reaching every year? How many non-Christians is your church re reaching every year? Ken gets 300,000 non-Christians to nowhere Kentucky. You know, so it, it just a, just they're building big, and there's a lot more going on there, and we're excited to have you guys out there next year, um, October 12th, 13th, and 14th. So the topic, the topic of our conference, lies, propaganda, storytelling, and the serrated edge. The reason why we invited Megan, Megan and Jason onto the show is because they're solid, biblical-minded journalists. And we, for the last two years, if it's, if it's not clear to you, you got problems. We've been lied to for the last two years in very significant ways. In almost every area, we've had major you know, lies thrusted upon us, and then we've been forced to comply to those lies. We've been lied about masking. We've been lied about COVID shutdown. We've been lied about the vaccination. It wasn't a vaccination until five minutes ago when they redefined the definition of what constitutes a vaccination this year, last year. So we've been lied to. The propaganda that we've been fed over these last two years the church has been very ill-equipped to handle it. In fact, most of your churches, most of the churches buckled under those lies and, and then encouraged your congregations to wear masks. They actually encouraged those lies in your congregation. Masking doesn't work. Then we just got canceled off YouTube right now. <laughs> <laughs> now that did it. That did it. It's like saying Aslan, you know, ivermectin. <laughs> I like these people. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, journalism, Knox, Knox uh, uh, where, I forget where he got it from, but the fourth estate of journalism um, is very important for our culture because journalists hold accountability, a lot of our other structures in, in, in the kind of a, uh, the cultural economy. They're kind of supposed to be accountability partners to us and, and to the church and to Fauci and to, but all our journalists, 87% of our journalists nationwide are liberals. That's the stats. 87%. And the other 13%, if they're conservative, I mean, you know, we're lucky to have a Megan in the house. We're lucky to have a Jason in the house. I mean, they're, yeah, exactly. That's true. Facts. Exactly. They're part of the 1% problem. <laughs> the other 1%. Yeah, the other 1%. That's right. That other 1%. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so uh, we, we hope to encourage you by the end of the show, we hope to encourage you guys 
to think about, okay, what, is, what does it mean? What does journalism mean to our culture, to our church, and, and what does it look like to be Christian journalists in a society that desperately desperately needs it. So Toby, you want to get us into the first question? Yeah, so um, this is a question for both of you. I'm going to, I'm going to start off with um, Jason and I'm going to come to you, Megan. But we, just... we don't get a chance to just say hello to the audience. We're going straight into the questions. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, Create! Gabe's talking about all these lies that are being told by the media. Uh, I, Knox told me that you all would all be masked uh, <laughs> and I'm not comfortable right now, so... <laughs> You told me this would be a, a mask environment, then I would be COVID safe, uh, Knox. Surprise! <laughs> Jason didn't read my it email. <laughs> I'm joking, by the way. <laughs> Everyone's like, awkward. This guy thinks we should be wearing masks? No, I don't. I'm glad to see no mask here. So, everybody, welcome Jason and Megan. Yeah. 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 It, if you don't know, Jason is the host of Fearless on the Blaze Network every day. What time? Uh, Monday through Friday. We air on YouTube at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we premiere on Apple and wherever podcasts are two hours before that, 5 p.m. Eastern. Megan is journalist. And you work for Daily Wire. Daily Wire, yeah. And uh, you can find me most often on our Morning Wire podcast, which, um, you know, a lot of people are not as aware of Morning Wire. It is a straight news, straight reporting podcast, which is a good topic. So it's not queer. It, <laughs> right, it's only, <laughs> only for heterosexual couples. No, it's, uh, it means it is not one of our opinion podcasts. So it's, um, we, we're just doing news there. We're not giving opinion. So it's actually a good basis for our conversation today because we have some opinion journalists. Journalism. We have some um, objective journalism, and uh, people don't tell um, the world this often from our team, but w we actually sometimes even beat my boss, Ben Shapiro. So check out Morning Wire if ooh, you don't. <laughs> ooh, ooh. That's a little dig. My goal, my alternative goal by the end of the show is to have Jason and Megan come and work for the Fight Laugh Feast Network. What's up now, you know? <laughs> That's why we really invited you here. <laughs> this is an interview. <laughs> So we just want to start off with a very light question, easy, you know, easy question, just kind of a softball question, just to kind of get things rolling, because that's kind of our style around here. We just real low key. We don't like a lot of, you know, conflict or, you know, controversy, no awkwardness or anything. So Jason, um, you know, uh, as a journalist, was Candace Owens and Kanye wearing a White Lives Matter shirt helpful? Uh, uh, helpful. You could argue that several different ways. It, it certainly has provoked another round of conversations as it relates to the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and it's provoking that conversation at a time when we're finally ready as a country to have the conversation that Black Lives Matter was a scam. And, and so, you know, I think it's helpful for Candace and the Daily Wire and the documentary that they're going to have come out on Wednesday, The Biggest Lie Ever Sold, The Rise of George Floyd and BLM. And so, uh, you know, I think in that aspect, it, it's, it's good for that documentary and to draw attention to a conversation we, we need to have. You know, the, for me, the teach I don't like Black Lives Matter. And so I don't like white lives matter. They're both stem from racial idolatry. And I think those of us that are believers and have an understanding that, you know, this whole race construct is not consistent with the Bible. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm not Message. comfortable with that aspect of it, but Kanye West is a provocateur, and he's built a fame built around uh, a career built around fame and drawing attention to himself. So I get what he's doing. Candace, I think, is trying to hype her documentary. I get what she's doing. It's not something I would do. Okay. So you wouldn't be rocking the shirt then, White Lives Matter? No, I would have a shirt on that said Black Lives Matter was a scam. I would have started the conversation. <laughs> Fair enough. Message. 
Megan. Well, I mean, I think in a way that's what that t-shirt was meant to convey. And part of what I liked was what immediately happened after that was Kanye going on Tucker Carlson and giving this interview where he talked about um, what's really happening with black lives and that 50% of black lives in New York City, for example, are being boarded. So that gave him a venue and an opportunity to say, here's the hypocrisy of the entire uh, established cultural institution world saying, well, we value black lives when they say nothing about the loss of black lives on that front. And then the other thing to me that was kind of interesting was, you know, as a woman who kind of follows fashion journalism a little bit, you always hear this talk about um, artists and the artists provoke and the artists do provoking things. And typically fashion journalism's job is to buy into whatever sort of ridiculous notion they put out there. If they send a woman walking down the runway wrapped in saran wrap, that's somehow a statement right. on her empowerment. Yeah. So <laughs> the fact that they had no interest in talking to Kanye or Candace about, well, what did you guys mean by that? What were you trying to provoke? What message were you trying to send? Vogue, all of those magazines that typically would ask those questions really were not interested at all in what Kanye was doing and immediately just rushed out to say, literally, they said what you expect to hear, this was violence for him to do this. Wow, so I think I need to remind uh, Megan the rules of, of our, our stage here is that um, we don't see race and we don't see women, okay? <laughs> Because you, you just said as a woman, and, and that just means nothing to no, us. No, no, Gabe, that's not true. Okay. No. And I gender. I just assumed by gender stereotypes that you guys are not familiar with the journalism in vogue. I apologize. <laughs> some, some of us. No, are. that's that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, one of the things that happened with the whole Kanye thing. When I watch Kanye, I look at somebody who knows how to run plays, right? And when he, and so you have a group of people who are absolutely doing what he wants them to do by the play that he runs. And one of the things that I see, especially in the Christian conservative movement, is that we don't know how to run plays, and we don't know when plays are being run on us. So what is the play that ultimately, because Kanye, I, I, I want to believe that he's thinking this through. What's the ultimate play you think he's running at the end of the day? Kanye's running a play for Kanye to increase his fame and to make a point. The, you know, and Knox, I know you know this, so I'm not correcting you, but my... my correct him, correct him, please. I, I'm not, I'm not, but you know, <laughs> there's nothing more powerful than the gospel. And so, mm. for Christians to run plays, mm. we've already been given the greatest playbook. Come on now, you better oh. preach up in here. Uh, <laughs> really, oh, you just got the organ. <laughs> all we have to do is have the discipline and the intelligence to follow the playbook. Mm. We don't do that, mm. and that's why it's so easy to run plays on us. Why don't, why don't we? Uh, because many of us have fallen in love with technology and think that we're the smartest humans to ever appear on the planet Earth, and so we, we buy more into the, the alleged science and experts than we do the ultimate expert. And that's many of us in the church. I mean, yeah. I have to remind myself yeah. constantly, like, yeah. you know what, he's already stated an opinion on this. <laughs> he already has a game plan. I, don't, I can turn the TV off. I don't have to listen to Fauci. I've got an immune <laughs> system designed by God. And if I treat that system he put in me well, it will take care of COVID. And I say that as someone who's overweight and at the beginning of COVID realized like I'm mistreating my immune system. Mm. I'm mistreating God's design. I'm very vulnerable to COVID. And anybody, that, these guys I've known for a while, Nick, I've probably lost 75, 80 pounds since the start of COVID. Yeah. 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 And so it just, <laughs> it just, we got a great playbook. We just got to follow the play. Well, don't you think part of this is we're playing the Game of Thrones board game when we should be playing football, right? We're playing the wrong game. I mean, we're, we're playing, right? But we're getting played by Game of Thrones. We're getting played by Fauci when we should be playing the, the real game's football. Yeah. Or, or, or run with that analogy. Baseball. Yeah. Baseball's the real game. Ah, man, that's not Trinitarian. It's not Trinitarian. What are you talking about I, I not got, Trinitarian? It, yeah, it's not. It's no, just but one guy and a pitcher going back and forth. That's it. It's weird. <laughs> 
No, I think Jason has a really good point there because part of what you saw with Fauci and all this game playing was you actually heard Christian leaders saying, well, we really want to store up our credibility until it's really an important hill to die on. We don't want to die right. on this hill. That's right. And that's not how we're called to do it. When you, there, I, I could not find any passage of scripture that said, here's what you do with truth. You store it up and hide it until a really crucial moment and then unleash the truth. Right. So yes, exactly that. And usually when you do that, you run that play and you keep saying, I think Pastor Doug mentioned this in a talk or to me recently, but the, 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 the temptation is to say, I'm waiting for the, the right moment, the perfect moment. But what usually happens is you compromise, you compromise, you compromise. And then when you finally actually do have what might look like the perfect moment, you're not willing to do it because you've been practicing cowardice rather than practicing courage. That's right. So here's what I want to do. I want to define the fourth estate. I want to kind of bring everybody up to speed. We got these four states that function and operate in the society. What the first estate is nobility, right? The second estate would be uh, the, the clergy. The third estate would be the kind of the common man. So you got nobility, you have wealth, you have fame, you have politicians, you have the clergy, which would be the church, and then you and also comedians. And, and well, yeah. Thanks, Gabe. Um, and then you I'm have. Just helping Jason now. That's Jason's thing. They have the Commonwealth, the average working man. But then there's this fourth estate, which is the press. Would you guys define for me the importance and what is the fourth estate and the importance of the fourth estate? I think we're the fifth estate, actually. Oh, what's the fourth? <laughs> I don't know what the fourth is, but the, I know, because as a journalist, I've always known that we're the fifth estate. Really? Oh no, so. we're the fourth. Are we the fourth? <laughs> Thank is you, Jason. Fight! 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 Megan. <laughs> Don't mansplain her. I always her. thought we were the fifth estate. I'm going to Google it later, and I'll get back Somebody to you. Somebody Google it real quick. I need to Google her. <laughs> Google it. Jeff Bezos is the fifth estate. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're the fourth. So, business? 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 Estate. Just money. Or, but that's part of the nobility that, yeah. that okay. Knox is talking about. I, mine was just more of a joke. He says fourth. Yeah, we're the fourth. fourth. Jason's right. My husband is so pleased right now. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she was wrong. So, Finally. Let's, let's define the fourth estate and the importance of the fourth estate. What, what, is, what is good journalism? What is it for? Why is it important? Well, it's supposed to be an exposure of the truth. And so journalism, for me, and I thought this uh, even when I was a kid in college and switched my major to journalism my freshman year, uh, I thought of it as service to my country and service to my vision as a Christian. I, I thought of it as a very noble profession. And, it, and so I graduated college in 1990, so this is 1985. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, I'm gonna go into this career as a journalist, way it served my country way to stay involved with sports. I've been involved with sports writing, but also I'm gonna be serving the truth and exposing the truth, and that was a way of serving God. And it wasn't about money. I can remember sitting in college classes thinking, man, when I'm 45, I, I'll be making about 75,000 a year, and I'll have life licked. And so it wasn't a financial pursuit. It was just about serving. <clears throat> and again, if the, Jesus has already told us the truth will set you free. The truth is very important. The founding fathers of this country, when they constructed it, Thomas Jefferson said at the outset, if I had a choice between government and a free press, I would choose the free press because he understood or he believed that if you tell people the truth, they'll make sound decisions that will protect and lead to the better health of society and your country. And so he just thought journalism and presenting the truth to the public critical to have a properly running nation. And obviously we've moved completely away from the exposure of truth and it's now all about narrative and propaganda and uh, protecting power. And, and that's why the country's in so much chaos. And I, these guys told me, you know, we maybe get to this at the end, but I'll stress it uh, now and probably repeat it several times. But as believers, it's important that we raise up our kids uh, to be journalists, to, it's a godly pursuit. 
And what we have now are atheists, secularists, and uh, liberals, Marxists. They understand the importance of journalism and controlling the truth. And, and we, and this is again where I don't like to call myself a conservative. I'm not offended when people call me a conservative, but I don't really like it because it doesn't really explain me or my mission. I would just want to be called a Christian and a, and a believer. And because when you start taking on this title of a conservative, a lot of people think it's about money and it's about capitalism and it's about acquiring wealth. And, and so conservatives don't see themselves as journalists because conservatives think, you know, I got to be wealthy, I got to this, that. Whereas progressives, serving their mission, they'll take a job in journalism for no money because they're serving their secular mission, they're serving their secular God. We don't see journalism as serving our God, mm -hmm. and we should. Ooh, we preaching. need to be in the business of spreading the truth on every platform available, and we haven't done that, and we're getting our butts kicked because we haven't made that sacrifice, uh, and we haven't discipled our kids in a way to understand this is another way to serve God. Mm. Great. That's great, Jason. Megan. Megan. Go ahead, Megan. Yeah. No, yeah, for me too. And, you know, one of the things that I would point out is that when you, uh, they did a study on the makeup of most uh, major newsrooms now, and the vast majority of the people who are working in the newsrooms are now coming out of elite institutions like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, which is a little insane because... I can say quite confidently that you do not need an Ivy League education to be a good reporter. You actually just need to be curious. And this is actually a job that I don't even think you need a college degree to do really, really well. And the fact that people um, are- That's virtually every job. Right, it, well, that's true. <laughs> What'd you say, Jason? That's virtually every job. He said, he said that's virtually every job. <laughs> especially as a reporter. And because it has become such an elite uh, career now, it is very separated from the everyman and from what people normally experience in their everyday lives. And I think that's part of how we got to this place where reporters are now reinforcing the narratives of people in other powerful institutions because these are the people that they know. It's the people they went to college with. It's the people that they're intermarrying with. If you go and look at some of the relationships between the newsrooms and DC, Zuckerberg. you will find a Cuomo. huge amount of intermarriage there. Um, so that's part of it, is that I think, look, this used to be a career and um, a profession that was representing the common people, and it doesn't do that now. So that's another reason it's really important to get into it. And also because we are Christians, and not only do we do this to serve God, but we know that no one else in the world has more access to objective truth than we do. Um, when you look at the liberal press, you go, they have nothing that they are measuring truth against. So I, I kind of love that um, analogy that uh, Pastor Jared gave in the first session where he talked about uh, Christian man versus rational man yeah, versus yeah, postmodern man. Yeah, and that is very, and so we are, we've been very much at postmodern journalism for a really long time. Now we're seeing the pagan journalism in that they are enforcing what you can report on. They are enforcing how you talk about it if you don't use the right terms, if you don't uh, use the preferred pronouns. And they're saying that all you have to capitalize black now, and, but you don't capitalize other ethnicities. So all of these things now have come full circle, just like he talked about. And Christians need to be offering the world an alternative because... We are the ones who can compare reality against the book and go, what is actually true here? Mm. So, so I want to add yeah, one yeah, thing yeah. that I forgot to add is that uh, I, I'm 55. I graduated college in 1990. I've watched this industry change uh, in the most dramatic change is, and, and I, I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm just saying, but the LGBT Q crowd, the alphabet mafia, I like to call them, runs corporate media. Yeah. I've watched this transformation with my own eyes. And so it's like 
<clears throat> we as believers love to talk about the importance of truth. LGBTQ, the other atheists, secularists, they actually believe in the importance of truth enough to get involved and to control and to put out their version of the truth. And so the LGBT crowd has taken over the media and that's why, again, allegedly there are three to 5% of the population, but if you turn on TV, you'd think they're 30% of the population. And then if you go behind the scenes and who's calling the shots, the executives, LGBTQ at the top of the food chain, LGBTQ controlling human resources departments in all industries, but certainly in the media industry a lot. And, and human resource departments and major corporations are the gatekeepers for who actually gets jobs and gets to work and who gets elevated. That's played out in the media, it's played out all across corporate America. Again, Malak's talking about playbooks. They are running plays. We have the best playbook. Are we reading it? Do we know what it tells us to do? Are, are we really grasping what, again, if, if truth is important to us, we should, Christians should be highly involved in the media. We should be discipling our young people. Get involved, don't worry about the money. Because I didn't get in this for money, but I've made a lot of money in this industry. Passionate, the I'm passion. I'm still waiting for that. And, and rewarded <laughs> for that. You got for, invited here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sorry. So it can be a very rewarding career financially as well, but even if it's not, it's important. And, you know, hopefully you'll get rewards in heaven for your service down here a little. You know, I, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I know we're saved by, anyway, I, I, let me. We're not going to get there by deeds, but damn it, get involved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, help me work out something real quick. I need both of you guys to help me do this. Jason, if they are the minority and we are the majority, even though they're inside the HR departments, we're still the ones that are out there in the, in the public. We're still the ones who are writing the stories. How is it they have so much control over us? In terms of the media? Right. They've got the key positions. Anderson Cooper, Don Lemon, uh, you know, Chris Hayes, he may closet it properly. I, I don't know. He looks like Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow <laughs> would be another one. Uh, and so on air, they got a lot of the key positions. And then in the executive levels, they have the key position. And then you have heterosexual Christian cowards mm. in positions that fold. And... Uh, because they're cowards, and okay. people okay. are afraid of Twitter. Okay, so this, this brings up, um, we have Dave Rubin. So, um, and both Daily Wire and The Blaze um, have interviewed and, and platformed Dave Rubin. I like Dave Rubin. I'm going to be honest with yeah. you. I, uh, I, and, and I disagree with his lifestyle. Yeah. But, and, and I don't want to analogize it directly, but... but I look at Dave's sin or lifestyle not much different than my gluttonous sinful lifestyle. Not much different than my very worldly. When I'm out in LA and I'm making a lot of money and I'm on TV, I wasn't the greatest Christian. I, I'm a good person. And uh, again, I don't, I've been on Dave's show uh, before he was at the Blaze, since he's been on the Blaze, he's been on my show. I've questioned him about his lifestyle choices. He's engaged in that conversation. We've had a respectful conversation. Many of Dave's values line up with my values. There's some big ones that don't, and he's gotten married, and they're doing some kind of spooky thing to have kids that I disagree with. <laughs> Uh, but he's willing to engage in that conversation and let me stand on my, tru my yeah. biblical truth. I don't have a problem with a guy like that. No, no, that's, that's good, and I, I think you kind of answered. My, my question was going to be, if you were to sit down with Dave Rubin, I'll pose this to Megan. If you were to sit down with Dave Rubin, you know, we want to have honest dialogue um, in, in our camps, and I'm talking kind of the broader 
I think Dave Rubin's more of a classical liberal who ended up in a conservative camp because that's, that's just what was available to him. Um, <laughs> True. Y- you know, but, but I don't see, you know, Jordan Peters, I don't see anybody having an honest dialogue. I think you have. I've seen, I've seen some of your stuff on this. So, Megan, if you were to sit down with Dave Rubin, what would your interview be like with him? I mean, one of the first things for me would be, it would be an interview. It would be some challenging questions. Um, you know, uh, part of what I, I like about the Daily Wire, which was really interesting for me, was going from a Christian news organization that I'd worked at for like 15 years to ending up in a secular news organization was suddenly having these conversations where we all kind of agreed where I'd worked before, or at least we did until the rise of wokeness. And then, you know, that created some new interesting fractures or fault lines, as Vody would say. But um, one of the things that was really fascinating to me was watching, for example, the interview between Ben Shapiro and Dave Rubin. And Ben has Orthodox Jewish convictions, and he directly told him, no, I wouldn't go to your wedding. Um, And they were able to still respect each other. And I'm going to guess, I don't know, but I would guess respect each other more for the honesty of saying, because this is what I believe marriage is, and this is what it was created to be. No, I could not go to your wedding. And if you watch that video, it clearly surprised Dave a little bit. At least that was my perception watching the video that he was like, well, you wouldn't even come. You wouldn't come to the reception. You wouldn't. And Ben said, no, I couldn't do that. And that was part of what I respected because I go, I don't know how many pastors that I know would have answered the question Ooh. that bluntly. Yeah. No, I would. Oh, in fact, facts. I know oh. for sure that the CEO and president of Christianity Today wouldn't have answered the question that way <laughs> because he just went to a gay wedding in 2019. So wow. I know that they are having tougher conversations in this secular news space than yeah. I saw in Christian news spaces. Yeah. Wow. Jason, can I, can I throw a punch your way? Yeah. It's a friendly punch. Yeah. Um, I think there's a difference between your lifestyle, even sinful, than a homosexual lifestyle. So I do too, yeah, but yeah. go ahead. I would just say that eating food can be sinful if you eat too much of it. Looking at a man in any sort of sexual way immediately is sinful, right? There's a distinction between the two. So there's a degree and level to which I'm saying, yeah, there's, there's a problem that you have if you go beyond that. There is no go beyond in homosexuality. It's, it is in itself I, I is a agree. problem. Dave, what, what, and again, I don't, I'm asking authentically. I don't yeah, know yeah. the answer to this, and anybody can jump in <laughs> here. Dave Rubin might say, uh, Jason Whitlock hung out in strip clubs in Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Kansas City, uh, J- Jason Whitlock was involved in some immoral sexual behavior. Yeah. Uh, and so how's that any? Well, there's a, there's a difference in, in what you're using as a past tense. Jason Whitlock was. No question. Jason Whitlock did. No question. I'm hoping and prayerful yeah. Yeah. that Dave Rubin's on a journey Yes. Like I'm on a journey. We are And too. we'll move away from that. Yes. And, and again, the, I'll move Dave Rubin out of the conversation, but I'm perfectly fine talking about it. But the reason why I'm really prayerful and thoughtful about this issue, I have a family member very close to that dealing with this issue, I'm going to potentially be put in this position. Yeah. Am I going to go to the wedding? My gut says no, but if I don't go, there'll be somebody who's extremely close to me that I won't be supporting on the hardest day of their life. So it's not just about the person who's getting married. Yeah. It's, that person has a father who I'm very close to and would need me because that's gonna be a very difficult day for them. And so, I think about these issues all the time. And, and the, the person in my family, I've been very supportive of this person. And I'm hoping, prayerful, hoping the Holy Spirit does a... <clears throat> I got to... Yeah, yeah. I it, absolutely. And, I, you know, the, those actually have a lot of the same things going on in my family very, very close to me. And so we're going through the same thing. And 
what my hope is is that my distinctions are sharp and that my love is really strong. Yeah, amen. Um, I want them to know that I'm the one trying to pull them out of the ocean that they're going to drown in. I know that you're doing the same thing. I know that's the same thing. And I want them to know that, hey, these are my distinctions. These are my lines. And yet you, I want to do everything I can that they know that I know that my uncle loves me. You know what I mean? And that's, that's what we're working through in the same way. And so I, I understand that. My only point with Ruben is, you know, and I'm going to take it back to Ruben. Uh, my only point Please do. I, I shouldn't have I shouldn't gone where I went. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I ain't going to make it. I got you. I'm, I'm going to take it back to Ruben. And here's, here's, I actually like Dave Ruben a lot. Yeah. So I don't want anybody to think that there's something else going on here. I really like him a lot because I think when I saw Dave Ruben had a conversation with Larry Elder, Larry Elder held nothing back from Dave Rubin. He lit him on fire. And Dave Rubin was willing to sit there and have the conversation with him and talk to him and kept throwing it back. And Larry kept boom, 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 boom. He wasn't being gentle at all with Rubin. And I had so much respect for Rubin, who wasn't a conservative, wasn't moving that way at all, sat there and had the conversation. I got to think about that. I'm like, whoa, I've never seen somebody take a beating like that and think through it and say, oh, I gotta think about that. And then when I saw, and I've seen some of the conversations with Ruben, I'm like, Ruben is a G. He's an open dude willing to really have tough conversations unlike most people who are conservatives. I don't, you don't need to hand, you know, have a um, soft or glove hands with him. I think he'd be fine like he did with, with, with um, ben, uh, Shapiro. ben Shapiro. And so I just watched so many other people kind of do like this. I'm like, why are you disrespecting Dave? That's disrespect for him because Dave is like, I really believe you. I'm open to have the conversation to work through things, but he won't ever work through it if we're not willing to be very distinct with our principles and have the conversation with them. That's all I'm... And you just explained why I'm respectful of Dave. Yeah. He's willing to have the conversation. Absolutely. He's willing to let me stand on my biblical values without calling me some kind of phobic whatever. Racist. Uh, ra yeah, or any of that. <laughs> and so, uh, that, I can deal with that. Yeah. It's the people that don't want to engage in the honest conversation, have no respect for my biblical worldview. That's the issue. And so, Dave, to me, allows the blaze uh, to have these conversations that need to be had. Right. Uh, Which is different than the other kind of HR department that is like, you're not having any of the conversations that you want to have. Yes. We're going to shut you completely all the way down and, and not engage this topic at all. Okay, I got to say something because I'm sorry, would you want to say something? Well, I was just going to go back to this question of why journalism is so important, and that's also why it's so important in Christian journalism as well and Christian media outlets because these conversations, we were starting to mirror the world where we weren't having them. And so when we started having them, yep. it got really uncomfortable. I'm and so glad you brought that up. Yeah, yep, oh, so we're, we're now on okay. Megan now. No, I'm okay. so glad you brought that up, <laughs> All right, Megan. we you just had Jason, now it's Megan's turn. Megan, you don't know how happy I am to see you here. You have no <laughs> idea. So 2019, I started working on a documentary called By What Standard with Tom Masco and Founders Ministry. We did a trailer. I don't know if anybody heard about the trailer, seen the trailer. <laughs> I think that's did all the they trailer? heard about the trailer. The trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I reported on the trailer when I was at World. Oh, I did oh. not know that. Interesting. Okay, so I was going to ask some of my questions. I saw at the time, we were at the sexual abuse or something in the SBC, and I saw a, a play being run on the SBC, and I said, oh, this is dangerous because they're using guilt manipulation the same way that they use the social justice movement and CRT and race stuff and slavery to get underneath the, the, the heart of the EBC, the SBC, the guilt there, and flip it and use it. And I'm like, they're going to do the same thing with the sexual abuse stuff. And the trailer came out, and the wolves came for founders and the trailer. And They us. lost their board because of that trailer. Right. Yeah, they lost their whole board because of that trailer. And... And so the film was turned. She was taken out of the trailer. And the, the, explain the, I mean, just in case anybody doesn't know, explain the, the thing that lit everybody's hair on fire. Yeah, well. yeah so um, making a trailer, part of what I do is allude to what's coming and show people that there's things that are be more in the film and reveal later what those things are. And I want you to have some sort of ideas. It's typography, it's um, symbolism. And Owen Strand said, um, that there are powers and principalities uh, working in the back. 
And at that moment, I put an out of focus image of Rachel Denhollander in the trailer to show this is the sexual abuse stuff that's gonna be the thing that's working in the back. Everybody said, did you just call Rachel Denhollander a devil? <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what I did. No, of course not. I'm trying to tell you there's something else underneath that you don't see that's going to get, manipulate you in a place that you don't want to go. In, in Scripture, principalities and powers sometimes refers to angelic, demonic beings, but sometimes it just refers to influential people, people who are influencing the world. Sometimes it just refers to political powers and so forth. That's, that's a biblical use of that term. So we made a doc that did not have that context at all a part of it. And the doc was still did very well and was very successful in the goal it was trying to do. But I always wanted to have that conversation. A couple years later, here you come. Oh, good. It's been so fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't it? Yay! <laughs> you going to make a trailer? I can help. I don't have a trailer yet, but... Why did you, out of all the things on the table and the SBC to grab, why did you grab that story and choose to write on that story And after it seems like it's kind of over? I mean, one, to me, the things that I'm always sort of interested in asking questions about are the things that everyone is saying, you can't ask questions about this because it's too emotionally loaded. That's because, right. Yeah, then it feels like there's, an, there's emotional extortion happening here. You're saying um, because trauma and uh, abuse is so difficult for people to talk about, we can't talk about it. So that was one. Um, and then there was just the basic facts that I started looking at the language, and it was in a way similar to the COVID question in the church, that the language that the church was using was not biblical language. It very much mirrored the cultural Can you the give an example of language. that, Megan? Can you give an sure. example? Sure, so for example, um, talking about trauma in terms of um, we cannot ask victims to recount their stories because that is traumatizing to them and it's re-victimizing a victim to say, okay, walk me through what happened here and help me understand the accusations you're making against a man who you say did something to you. Um, now, biblically, there is due process, That's and right. that was being circumvented. Right. And I, you know, I, I can appreciate certainly what Rachel Den Hollander has done. Absolutely. Absolutely appreciate what she did in the Larry Nasser case. Yeah. But yeah. at the same yes. time, I go, we, we have a biblical process of handling these questions, and that wasn't being utilized. So you start asking, why is that not being utilized? And then um, you also started to see how the uh, large establishment media outlets were using this story. And you go, okay, just like COVID, we are now using this story to say, you don't have to follow the biblical process because it's not enough and it doesn't do enough to care for women as though we can be more caring than God towards women. So that is a huge problem yeah, to put mm. ourselves. Yeah. You know, when I saw you take the story, I was thinking out of all the pastors, out of all the leaders in the SBC, here you come, <laughs> right? Out of every, and, and, and it was really interesting because, we, like you said, we do have a standard by which to go about examining this. We have the playbook. We have the playbook, right? <laughs> but so some of the things that were really shocking was that the numbers didn't add up either. Right, and so to get you know, a little bit in the weeds, um, when this Southern Baptist Convention abuse report came out and I started reading it, it just did not make sense. Um, you know, the key case that uh, featured on the, uh, took up the most space in this report was not um, the kind of story that we heard out of Catholic clergy abuse where this was priests abusing children. These were adult women. Um, the, like I said, the main key case was a woman who began a relationship with a married professor when she was 26 years old and it went on for, uh, till she was 38 and she didn't come forward to call it abuse until she was over 40. Huh. And, and, and even then, she lived in another state and was, I'm, so, and I'm not saying that I know what happened there right, because right. I was not able to get to the bottom of that, and that is part of the issue too, is that everybody just sort of said, like the Me Too movement, like the worldly cultural definitions, you have to take our word for it that this was abuse. Believe all women. It was very much a believe all women um, situation. And so that just, you know, sent off all kind of alarm bells. And then when I was told, you also don't get to ask about this, 
And um, it, in fact, oh, I, it, and it was Rachel Den Hollander who kind of used the term, it's voyeurism to ask for specific oh. details that would be able to corroborate this story. <laughs> wow. So at that point, I really had an issue and went, okay, it is not voyeurism to try to understand if a man is or is not guilty of, he, we already know That's he's right. guilty of sin, That's right. but is right. he guilty of a crime? Right. Is he guilty of abusing a woman? These are different definitions, yeah. and it's important to be specific about our definitions. Right. And then on top of that, these cases were being used to say, we have a massive problem in the Southern Baptist Convention that requires us to restructure how we approach the issue of abuse and create a list that is going to put people's names on it when they haven't been even charged with a crime, let alone convicted of a crime. Um, and that's a that's problem. That's in the church. This is, yes. And so, okay, and so this is really shocking. So if we would have had that fight in 2019 and, and use, you know, made the film about that, I don't know, or something, somebody could have picked it up, it didn't even have to be founders, anybody could have picked that up at that point and made that fight, I think it would have had a different impact on the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention not being gutted because they use that same guilt manipulation to help create this environment in SBC that really gutted the power of the executive committee to even function and everybody had to, to leave. It's always a power play. Well, and what, you know, kind of what was interesting to me too, getting back to the biblical principle and comparing these things against scripture, is you had women going, how dare you suggest that women sometimes lie? How dare you <laughs> suggest that Potiphar's, the, the story of Potiphar's wife could somehow uh, be a reference point for anything happening yeah. here? Well, the Bible gives us these things. The right. Bible warns frequently in Proverbs Men, beware of these kind of women. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that these women were like these women, but it's a possibility. And to say that we can't talk about it is to say you cannot apply biblical references to That's potential explanations. That's right. Amen. Now, now here's, here's one of the things that kind of bothered me about that whole SBC report and you talking about it. Um, when the trailer dropped, uh, they, Knox was talk, asked to take Den Hollander out of the trailer because they wanted to focus the message on social justice. They wanted to keep it there. Um, but then you come out with your analysis and your reporting on the SBC stuff, and <laughs> all these pastors started sharing what you were saying about the SBC report and you became this darling girl reporter for... I remember it differently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, you, you, you got hit. You got you, you hit for sure. Lumps. But all, all of a sudden... Um, but the conservative you, pastors... You, woman, woman was allowed to talk about it, and male pastors weren't. And they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But you touched it, and so they're like, well, I'll, I'll share Megan, what Megan's saying about it. And yeah, there, I, and I do feel that. I mean, it does feel a little bit like... And I guess in a sense, I get it. You go, okay, if a, if a black man writes about racial issues, then people go, okay, they're comfortable with that. If a woman's writing about abuse issues, I don't like it. I go, I want us all to be talking about yeah. these issues, no matter you know, whether you're man, woman, whatever color you are, let's all be talking that, about that's it. That's why we don't see women. <laughs> that, that's not what that means. Because, no, right? Gabe, that's, that's not, not right. You keep <laughs> saying that. <laughs> so, well, I actually want to press on that. So, I mean, how... Should Christians be do, going along with that? It, that sounds to me like intersectionality. That That's sounds right. to me like CRT. Social in, justice reporting. In, you know. Infiltrating journalism yeah. such that if, if you're not black, then you can't report on, I don't know, like the, right. B, the BYU deal. That's right. Uh, oh, oh, you know, oh, let's talk about that. Jason can talk about it, but I can't talk about it because you're just a white male. Or You can't challenge the narrative that there was no racism in right, the BYU crowd. Or, you know, if you're, if you're not a woman, you can't talk about abuse because you don't understand. Or, you know, the extreme versions, of course, is you can't talk about abortion because you're not a woman. Yeah. Um, is that right. intersectionality, CRT, Marxism, infiltrating journalism? Yeah, I would just reduce it to one. It's cowardice. It, it's yeah. Cowards yes. don't want to engage in a real legitimate discussion. Now, I can be mad at the cowards, but I'm more mad at the Christians who are playing by the cowardly standards. Come on now. And That's right. That's again, right. The, the entire right. point of cross politic and certainly the point of fearless is we're trying to 
shake men out of their cowardice. Yeah. That's right. And Amen. because it's our fault. Yes, it is. It, it's, it's, we can point a finger at them, but it's really us. Right. And we have to be, there, there's, there's just got to be a line in the sand that we, and I'll go back to Kanye, and this is where I'll give him credit. He, Kanye is clearly flawed, but it's like, he's just saying enough is enough, man. This is too crazy. Right. This whole Black Lives Matter, this is crazy. Right. This is unbiblical. Yep. And then for me, the thing that really put it over the top for me is this drag queen stuff with kids. If, if we're not willing to die over this, we're mm. cowards. Mm. Mm. If, if, that's right. Mm. That's right. Amen. Woo. Mm. That, that's just a fact. Mm. If they're going to come into the school systems with drag queens and with teachers that want to talk to five and six year olds about their gender, mm. that's. We fought in a lot of world wars, or two at least. Yes. We fought a, <laughs> probably more than that. <laughs> we fought in a civil war. Yeah. I, and I'll get deplatformed or called a sellout for this. Not but here. What you they're won't. doing to kids right now, I'm sorry, I believe it's worse than slavery. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. absolutely. Right there with you. Mm. Absolutely. And I think, I think, uh, Jason, one of the. One of the things that, you know, this is why we brought up the SBC report is, is, is we just, Christians aren't being honest with ourselves in all this. We aren't being honest with how we're actually being cowards in this cultural battle. One of the things I've actually appreciated about following you and, and our friendship and Knox's friendship with you and watching you on Twitter, just even on Twitter, you're like, yeah, I've, I've struggled with, you know, eating too much. And, and then recently I saw a tweet where someone tweeted at you, it's like, man, you're talking about families and you're always constantly talking about fatherhood and what why didn't you go be a father, Jason? And, and you just retweeted and said, you know, I made some mistakes. Yeah, you I know, failed. You, fa area. you failed in that area. Yeah. And, and I think that honesty is what actually, that, that confession of sin is what makes you a better journalist. Uh, and, and what facts. gives you. And that is courage. That's right. That's, 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 that's exactly right. Yeah. Men, and men don't get that. Men, men think that if they admit that they were wrong, men think that if they admit that they failed and then own it, confess it, repent of it as much as God will allow them to, they think that that makes them less of a man when actually that's the beginning of being a man. That's my, right. My new pet slogan is bearing witness requires courage, not perfection. And so, because mm. they're silencing us, well, you're not perfect. You call yourself a Christian, but you're not, like, yeah, of course. That's why I'm a Christian, because I'm not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and there's only one perfect person. That's right, amen. amen. So, amen. If, so only Jesus can speak the truth. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's, it's, they're silencing us with a, a standard of perfection that they don't hold themselves to. Right. And so bearing witness to Jesus, to the truth, it requires courage. That's, That's right. it. Yeah. Perfection, we ain't got it. None of us. Nobody in this room mm -hmm. has it. But we all can be courageous, and we need to be, because if we're not, I don't even have kids, but I'm just saying I love kids because I love my childhood. I loved my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I want every kid, to, and I was poor, really poor, but it was awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I want every kid to have my experience and they're stealing it from them. It's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I'm willing to die over this issue. Mm. Mm. But here's, here's what's happened is we believe the story, their story that they're thrusting upon us. They use the SBC story to push cower, uh, uh, pastors into cowardly corners. And then our, they use our sin to try to get hooks into us and so we don't us. speak the truth. Right. And so we're walking around like, like with a, uh, rocks in our shoes and we're trying to walk around and we're trying to bear witness to the truth but we're constantly feeling this this limp and we don't have the the full courage to be able to say what we need to say well and, and back i'm gonna bring it back to confession of sin again when you've confessed your sins to god and anyone you know of that you've wronged it's already dealt with and now what are they going to bring up on you that's right too too many people are afraid of being brought that they have all this backlog of unconfessed sin and that's how the devil keeps you down that's how he keeps you locked down because you're afraid they're going to bring something up that's right. but if you've confessed it all 
then you're clean. And you say, what do you got on me? You got nothing on me. It's been nailed to the cross. It's gone. I confessed it. The people that need to know about it, know about it. Well, you know, it was funny because as we're talking about this, it brought me back to, um, I think, something Pastor Wilson said in his opening talk today was this utopian idea, too, is they are taking a utopian standard. For example, in the SBC, the numbers were actually pretty small, but saying, because there was any, we have to have this massive overhaul of the system, and there's an expectation that we will be able to drive sin out of any institution perfectly, and that's not possible. Or any pastor is going to have, over sometimes a 50, 60-year ministry, if they have ever uh, sat over any instance of abuse and didn't handle it perfectly, you've got these activists who want to say, well, they're now discredited and disqualified forever, not because of something they did, but because they did not perfectly handle a situation. And And that's a utopian ideal. Nobody is going to have that kind of perfect track record. And the crazy thing is they want to, and and because of that, they want to say, we need to hand this over to a government agency. And it's not that the government agencies never failed. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you get another government agency to do it even worse. They don't, they don't fix it. They don't get it better. Compare the numbers um, in the public school system that. Yes. to the SBC. That, that was my soft toss. Yeah. Did you get it? Did yeah, you get it? it is. <laughs> Yeah, there is something like like ten. I I I'll have to look it up, but it was obviously I'm not great with numbers. So, um, <laughs> but it was something like um, 10% of ki- of all kids in um, the public school system have experienced some kind of inappropriate sexual interaction. With Which was far more than the Catholic Church, far as more. sinful as that is. And it, it's astronomically more than the SBC. And so right. someone should have said... we don't hear anything about that. We don't hear anything about shutting down the public schools. Yeah. If we're going to shut yeah. something down, yeah. let's shut the you government know? schools but, down. But, yeah. but, you know, and no one, no one said, hey, how do we get government schools to look more like the SBC? That's what they should have said, That's right? what we should have said. No one, and yeah. no one made the argument in the church, hey, we're doing way better than y'all because we got the gospel of Jesus Christ, yeah. right? No one made the argument that way at all. And that actually should have been the argument that, look, you, people go, well, we should have lower numbers because we're the church. Well, we do. It is yeah. outrageously by the grace of so God. much lower yeah. by the grace of God. Yeah. And that look actually should have been the headline. Cross <laughs> politic. Go SBC. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Tom Askell should have been was, president. There was not Just nearly as much enthusiasm for that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are all y'all Presbyterians by this point? You know, is that what happened? <laughs> some rowdy ones at least. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the focus of journalism. Matt Walsh has been amazing. Can we hear from Matt Walsh? Jur- journalist of the year. I mean, Seriously. Journalist of the year. He Seriously. Has been at, so, and he's been going after the transgender surgery stuff. Like none other, what is a woman? Great job, Matt. So let's take Matt Walsh and transgenderism and let's put this and, in a and little Vanderbilt. box. And Vanderbilt. Let's put that on a little box. Now, you guys get your own little military of journalists, okay? And, and an and a endless, you know, an endless budget. budget. Say you get Ken Ham's $100 million. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and an army of journalists. What is it that you're like, like Matt Walsh, what do we go after to start exposing the truth of to help change the culture? I mean, for me, I, and maybe it's just because this is my particular passion, but I'm highly interested in what's happening in the church and that cowardice you talked about and how the church is being co-opted by um, cultural institutions, particularly government institutions. Um, you know, some stories I'm working on right now is, and I actually met someone in your uh, lovely audience who's going to give me some great information. Thank you. <laughs> hey, how about that? How Anybody about else? Will there be another? <laughs> on how, um, for example, the National Association of Evangelicals has now pushed uh, climate change activism right. as a gospel yeah. issue and so yeah. a part of the Great Commission. I think, to me, this is so important because we are the bulwark. We are... Um, the, the sort of the last bastion. And if we are co-opted and taken over, now the church is gonna stand against the gates of hell, but it, it may not stand in this nation. I mean, that's something that we have Ooh. to think about. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so for me, that is the number one thing I would do is train Christian journalists to go, if we just simply parrot what the powerful institutions say, 
then we as Christian journalists are uh, flavorless. We're saltless. We, we have no flavor and we have no impact. So you're going digging after the things that are coming to get the church, the dragons that are coming after the church. You're yeah. Saying, and, and not necessarily, yeah, just to, I don't want to attack the church, but no, to no, no. say we have to teach the church to go, we have to care about truth first before we can take the truth out to That's the rest right. of the world. That's Expo- right. You will expose the lies and the hypocrisy in leaders in the church. Expose. Yeah, and teach them that we don't just repeat what is comfortable for us to repeat. Mm, that's good. Jason. Uh, I, I want to second Charles' opinion on Matt Walsh. I think Guy has just done a tremendous job and is a role model for all of us, and hats off to him. Thank God for him. Uh, and so I, I think what Megan's talking about is very important. For me, my passion is... Uh, kind of history and race, and there's, I was watching a sermon this morning uh, from Vody Bauckham that uh, uh, he had a phrase, he said, the, the meat of a lie covered by the skin of truth. And that's what has happened with this whole racial discussion in America. It, there's a skin of truth that America had a racial problem. That's a skin of truth. That skin is covering all these lies that they're telling to pervert this country. And, and so the New York Times is a reason why they did the 1619 Project, is, is they want to use the skin of truth that America had a racial problem to, to cover the meaty lie that America is a irrevocably, irredeemably racist country, abusive and oppressive to anybody that's not a white heterosexual man. And so they, they've taken the skin of truth of this racial and, and, and just have really perverted American history. And I, I've given speeches about this, I talk about this on my show. We need a lot of journalism built around a proper telling of American history. Our schools have been, have abandoned a proper telling of our history. It's been turned over to the media. The media is driving a very divisive narrative that paints America very negatively. And America's racial history is actually our greatest history. Mm. It's actually proof of God's power mm. when a That's nation right commits Mm -hmm. to designing a system, and again, any understanding of the Constitution, those guys were sinful men, no different than you or I, anybody in this room. But in that endeavor, because God uses sinful men because we all are. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so in that endeavor, they were God-inspired in writing the Constitution, using biblical principles, and they designed a system that self-perfects over time, with the additions of amendments and things like that. And and what actually made America great is the black American journey because blacks in fighting for freedom and equality and opportunity in this country made America live up to the promises in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution And so that actually put America on steroids. That's why we're the freest, most opportunity-filled land or were uh, in the planet's history. That's why people beat down doors and will walk across other countries to invade our country through our southern border or through that southern door uh, that we've opened up. And, And if there's a proper telling of American history, black people will take far more pride in this country's success, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and white people will understand the sacrifices that were made to give freedom to everybody, women, black people, Asian people, whomever. Uh, and so I just see so many people that don't have a proper understanding of American history. They, they pervert the Civil War. They, the Battle Hymn of Republic they're singing songs on the battlefield, acknowledging that they're dying so that me and Knox can live free. But somehow 
we want, those people are racist. They gave up their lives knowing that they were doing it to benefit me and Knox, and somehow I'm supposed to believe this country is my enemy when mm. you couldn't get me or anybody else, my color, to, you couldn't get us to leave here at gunpoint. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, but they've taken the skin of truth that we had a racial problem and told incredible lies that are this, it's central to how they're undoing this country and taking us backwards. And so I just think our history needs to be told properly. Our racial history needs to be told properly. We're gonna have to re-educate young people. We've poisoned the minds of so many young people. I see it and, and I don't wanna get too caught up in the videos that I see over social media because I don't trust social media, but I just see the discord and the animus that has been planted in kids. You've been mistreated and you've always been mistreated. This country's terrible and that white person next door to you hates you and they got a, their life is perfect and, and yours is miserable and the only difference is because of your skin color. And I'm like, man, I know some white people that are very miserable and had a much harder <laughs> life than I did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like, so anyway, I just think a proper telling of American history and its racial history is central to saving this country. I'll just, I'll just plug real quick. I read an, not everything you write, but you write an essay pretty regularly. How yeah. often do you publish? Three to four day, times a week. Um, and it is great reading. It is. Uh, Jason is a great writer, but he's frequently digging into history and talking about these things, and, he's, and it's, it's, a really, it's really worth your time to read. Um, but, you know, you mentioned history and race, but I, I want to I throw this at you, but can, what about sports? Because I, I'm hoping that you're going to unwoke sports. <sighs> can, can you do that for me? I'm going to need a drink on it's this rough, one, Jason. Man. <laughs> it's rough. Can you at least unwoke sports reporting? It's rough. <laughs> it's, 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 hey, and this is where Knox is right in terms of the plays they're executing. They planted these seeds long ago. And uh, they threw, and it's a lot of it is social media. The other thing I'm really passionate about, probably my second thing, is, is getting people to understand how social media really, really works against us. We know social media is rigged against us, but I don't think we have a full context and understanding that uh, all these social media companies and all big tech being founded in Northern California and San Francisco, I don't think we comprehend the, the importance of the fact that they're founded in San Francisco. I don't think, again, this goes back to not understanding history and history not being taught properly and why we have to have Christians involved in reporting and journalism and, and reporting history. Everybody that will make a sports analogy, the, the San Francisco 49ers, yeah. the 49ers nickname is based off the gold rush in the 1800s. I, I read that article. Okay, yeah, I, the, I like that bring one. It, Go, tell, bring tell, it, bring it. In the 1800s, <laughs> there's a gold rush uh, in Northern California. And that's why the San Francisco 49ers are called the 49ers that time. Sounds racist. <laughs> so what happens <laughs> is men start leaving their homes in other parts of America to hunt gold in Northern California. They docked their boats in the San Francisco Bay. At, in the 1850s, 93% of the San Francisco area was men. 93%. And we're wondering why it's the LGBTQ alphabet mafia That's right. headquarters. That's right. 93% of your population is men. The LGBT crowd has written about this history. That this isn't me coming up with my own conclusions. They talk about where the cross-dressing and the alternative lifestyle and all that, why it took root in San Francisco. And so that culture from its inception was 
The, El the Alphabet Mafia seeds were planted in the 1850s, and that it, it shapes that culture and that whole environment in Northern California, and now our media caters to that culture. All the social media platforms, Google, all of this stuff is based in Northern California. Their values are being pushed out through our cell phones, through these platforms, to the rest of the world mm -hmm. and to the rest of the United States of America. And so people don't understand, it's like, when I'm 55 again, when I came into the business, everything was catered towards New York liberalism. Mm -hmm. That media catered to New York liberals. That's a different liberal than Northern California liberals. Facts. Northern California liberals are alternative lifestyle, and they're revolutionary. The Black Panther Party was established there. They're Marxists in Northern California. That's the headquarters for the Alphabet deal and the Marxism, and our, all of our social media platforms, everything in our phone is basically geared towards pleasing that culture. That's how they're corrupting our minds and our young people and our culture. And, and we have to under, we gotta understand who our enemy is. Mm -hmm. it's, and again, I'll give you, a, I've given a speech on this about, you gotta understand who the opponent is. I, and, and you know, a football coach come in and say, hey, we're playing Michigan this week and this is the offense they like to run. As Christians, we need to know, we're playing against Northern California mm. and they run a Marxist, alphabet mafia, racial offense. Oh. And that's what we gotta prepare to play against. Oh, it, that's it, good, that, Jason. You better clap for him. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. But it, it, it strikes me that this ties back into something you said earlier about journalism and money. But, I mean, no, I mean, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil, but it does say that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And you've got a hotbed of a bunch of men who are lusting for wealth, lusting for riches. Uh, what could go wrong? And, and <laughs> thank you, uh, Toby, for making that point because, again, the gold rush was a get-rich-quick scheme. Right. Big tech is a get-rich-quick right. scheme. That's right. You, we've empowered 32-year-old billionaires through this big tech thing. These are children. Right. The, the, these, and they've been showered with billions of dollars in power, and they're not built for it. They're not mature enough for it. They, they've upset and turned over the apple cart. Right. And I, and I just, and he's exactly right, but I just also want to return to the point that we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. And, that, and we need, and this is God's world, it belongs to him, and as he gives us authority, and if he, if, he, if he blesses you with wealth, praise God, use it well, use it wisely. Jason said he's been blessed. Meg's still waiting for her gold rush. <laughs> but uh, any day now, now that you've been on cross politic. Um, <laughs> it's, it's coming. Uh, um, but, but my point, though, is this, but... Usually, God's method is usually long term. That's right. Usually, it takes lifetimes, and sometimes it's multi generations. We need to be thinking like that. In fact, they've been thinking like that. That's right. The pagans, back to Jason's point earlier, frequently believe more in their false narrative and their false gospels than Christians who have the true gospel. That's right. And That's so right. they're laying their lives down, sacrificing their lives, doing the work of activism and false journalism and all the rest, um, believing their false stories. But we know the Savior. We know Jesus, who is risen from the dead. And so we ought to be at the forefront of laying our lives down, sacrificing our lives to build the business God's called you to build, get married, have kids, you better baptize them. And, and, but... And, and become journalists who work for nothing, who work for whatever they can, for pennies, to, to get the truth out there because you believe and because you're following Christ. That's right. Gabe, I'm going to let you finish, but Megan yeah. had the best comment of all time. Go ahead, okay. Megan. Well, I was actually just going to bring up, um, in addition to training people to be journalists, train them to be good news consumers as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, yes. I mean, I, if I can give a little plug for my former organization, World Magazine, they have a great product for kids. It's a video product, and it teaches them how to consume news and how to be news literate and look at it critically. 
And I think that's really important because a lot of what I see when I see a lot of young, well-meaning Christian journalists is they also sort of think, well, whatever um, you know, the big power centers tell us, that must be the truth. And I don't want to seem like a conspiracy theorist, so I don't want to question that. So I know there's a lot of homeschoolers here, so I would really encourage you to um, make use of resources like that and train your kids because you know they're not going to hide from media forever. And teach them when they're with you and you have control over the environment how to sort of see through the narrative that's being pushed on them. Thank you. So, um, yeah, yep. You can clap for Megan. <laughs> uh, I mean, are, are Jason and May Megan hired at this point? But yeah, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yep. Pack your bags, you're moving to Idaho. <laughs> And, and this just, um, might as well just end with a sales pitch right here. If, if, if all of our audience here today become club members at $10, 25 50 $100, you can sign up even for annual, um, you today could help us meet almost most of our budget needs next year. Um, so really, seriously consider becoming a club member. This is how you can partner with us in what we're doing with Cross Politic and the Fight Laugh Feast Network. And I know a number of you are already, a significant amount of you are already club members, and we really appreciate you guys. But um, we're competing against Daily Wire and Blaze, and, you know, we, we need you guys to be club members. So uh, that's, that's my final uh, pitch before uh, we exit here. I'm getting ready for church. It's time for church. It's offering time. We only got to two of your questions, I think, uh, Toby. We got, to, we got to about two and a half of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's looking at you like, when are you going to ask me that? Yeah, we, got, we, got, we got more. <laughs> so... Uh, if you're single, if you're married, and if you have kids, yeah. until next time, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight. Laugh. This is Cross Politic. Thank you, guys. All right. All right. Can I get the podium up here? So... I get the last word to you. So at the end of our conferences, we have a Fight, Laugh, Feast manifesto. Since Toby got to speak twice to you guys, I get the last word. So I get the Fight, Laugh, Feast manifesto before we go into our Sabbath dinner and comedy show and so forth. So as we're getting the uh, podium up here, I'll, I'll kind of give you directions to the Sabbath dinner when we're done here. I'll pray at the end of this. I'll bless the food so when you get over there, we can start eating and fellowshipping. But basically... We're in the next convention center under the uh, bridge here. It's just a 15, 20 second walk. You get over there and, that's, and then you'll go into the doors. You'll see signs and go up the stairs and that's where we're at. All right, my lapel on. Mic check. My lapel on. My lapel on. One, two, one, two. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we like to end this two day sprint with a manifesto. We like to end with a charge, with an exhortation. And so I'm gonna begin here with three verses for you. John chapter 18, verses 37, Pilate therefore said to him, you are a king then? Are you a king then? Jesus answered, you said rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth hears my voice. Matthew 12, 28 through 30. But if I cast out demons by the, by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Lastly, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that every name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The church has been plagued by Gnosticism, which means that we've bought into the idea that Jesus is king of heaven and, and only over spiritual matters of this earth. That's it. Jesus is some sort of spiritual king that you can sing cheesy worship songs to and just maybe someday he might ask you out. 
The modern church also thinks when Jesus returns at the end of all things, the world is going to disappear, it's going to go away, and all Christians are going to go up into the fluffy clouds up into, up into heaven where the streets have no name. But God loved the world so much that he gave his only son for this world. King Jesus came to die to save the whole, this whole world. He did not come to die and grab the faithful few and disappear into heaven. Not at all. God's sovereign plan for salvation of this world is comprehensive, it's dominant, it's, victor it's victorious, which is to say in practical, practical terms that at the end of all things, more people will be saved than those who will go to hell. That's a victorious king. And, and by a long shot. The reality is that Jesus is in the process of building a new heaven and, and new earth here. And he's restoring this broken world and everything in it. The world is not going to disappear at the end of time. Or what would the meek inherit? If the world's gone, what, what, what God promised, what did the meek inherit? Well, in our three texts, we see that Jesus came to this earth to be king. For this cause he was born, and we know that the kingdom has come upon us. How do we know the kingdom has come upon us? Not only because Jesus was born and he came into this world, but because, as our text says, that he cast out demons. And that is evidence that the kingdom is here, that the kingdom is upon us. Our text in Philippians clearly states that one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. This text is actually a quote from Isaiah, and the word translated confess here is, in Isaiah is actually oath, taking an oath. In other words, every tongue will take an oath one day that Jesus is Lord. God's kingdom is here, but remember, it also starts out like a mustard seed. The kingdom does not fully appear like a two-minute microwave dinner. And to work in a barbecue metaphor here, on the contrary, the kingdom is more like a 12-hour slow-cooked pork shoulder. Yes, amen. This is why we use the phrase already but not yet, to communicate that the kingdom of God is here but not fully realized here on earth. And the kingdom is expanding throughout his church to the whole world and will one day not just be a mustard seed but a fully developed tree that will cover the whole world. The kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God are not two ships passing in the night. That's the two kingdom narrative. That's kind of the evangelical narrative where the kingdom of, of God is going this way and the kingdom of this world is going this way and they're just two ships passing by each other. That's not what's happening. The kingdom of God is conquering that ship. The kingdom of God is taking over that ship. The kingdom of God is taking over this world through the reign of King Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Yes. Now we are living in chaotic times. This is obvious to all of us. That's why you guys are here. We are living in chaotic times, humanly speaking. The FBI is currently being used to weaponize against faithful pro-lifers right now. Evil is good, good is evil. The medical industrial complex will devour young men and women, ripping their bodies to shreds in the name of helping those kids find their true selves. Churches blindly follow Master Fauci by shutting down their churches, requiring masks that don't work, and remain silent as their congregation had to deal with forced vaccination policies. You guys had to deal with forced vaccination policies, not your pastors and elders doing Starbucks hours. The pre and, 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 I mean, President Biden can't even walk off the stage without getting lost. I mean, that's, that's how crazy our times are. But in all this chaos, Jesus is king. Jesus is king when things are tough. Jesus is king when life is good. When Paul was shipwrecked, was Jesus king? Did Paul all of a sudden get, you know, get in the water, jump out of his ship, get in the water and say, oh, oh, I don't know if Jesus is king yet? When Paul was facing his 40 lashes minus one, did he think Jesus is king? When he was cold, when he was naked, when he was abandoned, do you think Paul doubted the kingship of Christ? When your business is suffering, when you're battling temptations in the wilderness, when your marriage is on the rock, no doubt, Jesus is king. As Rush Dooney said, life is rarely easy, but with Christ our king, life is always good. I got one qualification, then a close here. What, I, what I'm about to say is not speaking against the civil government's God-given authority that we should honor and submit to. There's a, there's, a, there's a real authority that we submit to with the civil government. 
as it regards to their God-given lawful authority. That is, that is not our problem, especially here. I think we understand that the civil government has an, a place that God has given them. Our problem is that we don't know the difference between our government who has a limited and bestowed authority and Jesus' sovereign authority. Our government's authority is a derived authority. Jesus' authority is a, is a sovereign authority. The world tells us, okay, hang on here. Our problem is that we don't know the difference. We put masks on our face, we buckle up our seatbelts, we get permission to start our restaurants, we don't rip up the tag off our mattresses, we build our houses with studs 16 cent, you know, inches apart, all because we're good little boys and girls, because the government told us, because we fundamentally are acting like our government has sovereign power over us. That's why we are doing those things. We are better at submitting to king secular government than Jesus. We all might as well have gone to public schools because all of us are acting like it, and we need to stop it. The modern evangelical church believes in a Jesus as defined by the word, not defined by scriptures. By the world, not defined by scriptures. We believe in a king Jesus, and the world is giving us a, that definition of what it means to, that Jesus can be king. The world has told us what kingship Jesus has. Like the definition of love, we have given the definition of what it means for Jesus to be king up to the world. The world has told us what love is, and the world has told us what, king, what it means to be king. Jesus can be king in our hearts. Jesus can be king inside our churches. But Jesus cannot be king of the public square. And all the Christians say, amen, Caesar. Christians, you can't force them to follow. And then, and then they come at us and they say, you can't force Jesus upon us. You can't force your religious laws on us. You can't force your religious laws on us. Instead, you have to have neutral laws that everyone should be forced to follow. You should, have, you should be forced to everyone to believe that secularism should be the supreme religion. So they say, Jesus can't be supreme, but secularism can. And again, all the Christians say, amen, Caesar. But Jesus is not asking for permission. He is king, and so we should not be asking for permission from the world to worship God, to obey him, to declare the gospel, to disciple our children, disciple the nations. We aren't asking for that permission. We don't need permission from President Biden, from the FBI, from the principalities of powers. We aren't asking for permission from them because Jesus already gave you your orders. Jesus already gave you permission. You have King Jesus's permission. What is more freeing, King Jesus or King secularism? We, we you know, right now we're, kind of being charged with this, you know, oh, you guys are Christian nationalists. I, I absolutely prefer Christian nationalism over secular nationalism any day. You give me that choice, I'll take it, because Jesus is king. Jesus is not entering into history to try and manipulate history into his desired outcomes. That's what, you know, Jesus didn't come to, well, crap, I messed up, I need to come, I need to fix the world now. Something, something, how can I manipulate it? right again. Jesus did not come into history to manipulate history. Not at all. He's a sovereign over history, and his plan for salvation includes the whole world. It includes you. It includes your wife. It includes your children, your family. It includes America. It includes Russia, Ukraine. You name it. There's not one square inch that Jesus does not claim. Vladimir Putin needs to obey, needs to bow his knee. He needs to swear an oath to King Jesus. The president of Ukraine, I'm going to mess up his name, he needs to swear an oath to King Jesus. President Biden, you need to swear an oath. Your tongue needs to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so that leaves everyone with two options. There's only two options in this world. Either you bow to King Secularism, bow to the devil, or you bow to King Jesus. Either, either you're crushed under the rock of Christ or you're crushed on the rock of Christ. Those are two different choices. Either you're crushed on the rock of Christ or you fall by the grace of God on Christ. Both options involve dying. Are you gonna die to your sin? Or, or by, the gra by the grace of God, are you gonna die to your sins and receive Jesus as your Lord? Are you gonna shout that oath to King Jesus? 
Are you going to confess King Jesus? This is what we're calling the world to do. So as you go from here, as you fight your sin, fight uh, well with your brothers and sisters, sharpen iron with your brothers and sisters, as you fight and engage culture with the kingship of Christ, go from here. Go from here and laugh. Laugh because the joy of the Lord is our strength and Jesus is king. And go and feast because God has prepared a table before your enemies because Jesus is king. Amen. Amen. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and stand and uh, we'll finish uh, with a prayer and with the doxology and I'll go ahead and pray for us. I'll bless the food. As you guys get over there, you can just start eating, get your table, you know, get your kids all sorted, go through line and everything. Feel free to just get into the food and get into the drinks over there. So let me, let me close in prayer and bless this food and then um, uh, we'll end in, in the doxology. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the time at this conference, for bringing us all here to encourage one another, to sharpen one another and for the fellowship we have in Jesus. I pray that as we go from here, that you will apply your word in our lives, that you would work in us to will and to do for your good pleasure, that we'd receive and believe your word anew in our heart, in our soul, and in our minds. Do not let your word go void in our lives, but fill us with your spirit so that your word would return 30, 60, and 100 fold for our good and for your kingdom. We now thank you for the food that we're about to eat, the gift of this time of fellowship, and for all the staff that have served us at this conference for these three days. Bless the food, and we pray that you would give everyone a safe trip home following this conference. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures.